En segundo lugar, nos gustaría conocer un poco cómo es ese proceso en tus estudios en donde empiezas a darte cuenta que hay necesidad de cuestionar la teoría clásica de evolución, en dónde pueden haber falencias, dónde están los errores, por qué no es consistente y por qué la necesidad de replantearla o investigar acerca del origen de especies y el origen del hombre. One of the things that's different about my education versus most of my scientific colleagues is that I grew up with a private education, private school, home school, instead of a public school. In the public schools you're required to learn only evolution. In private schools you can teach creation and evolution. And I was taught both growing up. Even going to creationist seminars, they taught us evolution. So much so that I could, and still can, articulate the evolutionists' own arguments. And one thing I observed over the process of many years is how resistant the mainstream community was to any sort of change, any sort of alternative idea. Science is supposed to be about following the evidence where it leads. And watching how people of various camps, there's young earth creationists, there's old earth creationists, there's evolutionists who accept Christianity, there's people who question certain aspects of evolution but accept the old earth time scale. There's a whole range of views, but what I observed was anything that questioned evolution and evolution alone as, a, as an explanation was treated illogically. I don't see why any scientific idea would need to be protected from criticism. That to me was one of the biggest lessons of graduate school. I went into graduate school wanting to work on cancer and I, and I had the specific idea about how cancer occurs which is apparently wrong but I learned that in graduate school. And I viewed anyone who disagreed with me as a problem, as a hurdle to be overcome. They were the enemy who were impeding progress. When in fact, the biggest enemy, if you can use that term, is reality. Every scientist has a guess as to how the world works, whether it's cancer, whether it's the origin of species, someone, you start with a hypothesis. This is how I think the world works. It may be wrong, Reality is a certain way. There's a certain way cancer arises, there's a certain way species arise, and there's a thousand different hypotheses and guesses. The vast majority of them are going to be wrong. And so a good scientist knows how to find the correct hypothesis, and if he's got the wrong hypothesis, he knows how to identify its weaknesses, quickly discard it, move on to something close to the truth. That's, that's what makes science what it is. Being able to identify competing hypotheses, design experiments to test those hypotheses, and get close to the right answer as quick as possible. You have to consider everything to be a good scientist. All explanations, because oftentimes a hypothesis is wrong for boring technical reasons. I do an experiment and it turns out to be giving the wrong answer because I misunderstood something about how the technique works. Nobody cares about that, but that's, that's, that's a competing hypothesis. It's critical for how science works. And so, observing how the origin of species discussion, how the origin of life, the origin of everything, creation versus evolution, how that debate happened and how much the mainstream community was resistant to this, to me is a big clue that there's something wrong with the mainstream scientific explanation. No scientific idea should be protected from questioning. You should go where the evidence leads, and for the past 10 years have been trying to do that exactly with the origin of species. And have made a bunch of surprising discoveries in the field of genetics. Maybe one of the biggest discoveries has been the fact that Darwin took a massive risk. So I grew up, again, learning creation, learning evolution. Uh, the discussion was dominated by discussion of fossils, anatomical comparisons, embryological comparisons, uh, the classification of life, geology, astronomy, a little bit of genetics, but that wasn't the major theme. If you think about the origin of species, and you dig into, well, how are they defined? What defines a species? 
there's many different ways, many different answers you'll discover. But what they, what they tend to have in common is species are defined by their heritable traits. Inheritance is a critical aspect of what defines a species. Well, what's the field of science that deals directly with inheritance? Genetics. It's the only field of science that does. All these other fields of science that have dominated the creation evolution discussion are indirect fields of science. So what does that mean? It means if you want to answer the question of the origin of species, you have to deal with genetics. It's the only direct record of a species ancestry, which is what defines a new species. So what did Darwin know about genetics in 1859? He doesn't even use the term because the term is not invented. He talks about, in chapter 5 I think it is, our ignorance of the laws of variation, variation being the closest thing they had to genetics at the time in, in England, in English. He says our ignorance of the laws of variation is profound. So if you go from Darwin forward in time, if you look at the history of genetics, it wasn't until about a century later, 1953, that the scientific community recognized DNA is the substance of heredity. That's where we need to look if we want to understand genetics. So it takes a hundred years after Darwin writes this book for scientists to recognize, oh, this is how we discover the origin of species. Then it takes another 50 years, right up to the present day, for the community to have a sampling of the DNA of species around the globe. In other words, we are now, at this moment, finally have in our possession the critical tools to investigate the origin of species for the first time. Darwin tried to answer a genetic question before anyone had the genetic tools with which to answer it. It's a massive risk and I can't think of another scientific parallel to it. To, to vigorously argue for an idea 150 years before you'd actually be able to discover the answer is remarkable. Now, he used the tools available at the time to test the ideas of his day, the creationist ideas of his day, and his book is filled with here's how this evidence, this evidence, this evidence, this evidence disproves creation. What most scientists don't recognize, maybe because they're resistant to any questioning of evolution, what most scientists fail to recognize is that today's creationism is very different from 1859. And so the evidence that Darwin used doesn't really apply anymore. It disproves an old version of creation, it does not disprove the modern one. And on top of that, the modern creationist view makes testable predictions. What I've seen for 40 years is that the mainstream scientific community has said we're not even going to think about creation science because it's not science. It doesn't make testable predictions. That's factually an error. I've made testable predictions and some of the research I'm doing now is looking in, in, and seeing if they're being fulfilled. I've already seen some of these predictions be fulfilled. And so the debate, the origins debate as it exists today, very different from 1859 and even very different from 40 years ago.